Welcome to Influential Entrepreneurs, bringing you interviews with elite business leaders and experts, sharing tips and strategies for elevating your business to the next level. Here's your host, Mike Saunders. Hello and welcome to this episode of Influential Entrepreneurs. This is Mike Saunders, the Authority Positioning Coach. Today we have with us Patty Creamer, who's the owner of Productivity Uncorked, and she is a coach for financial advisors. Patty, welcome to the program. Thank you so much for having me, Mike. I appreciate it. You looking are welcome. I'm looking forward to it as well, and I love the, the name Productivity Uncorked because it just feels like something popping, exploding, and awesomeness coming out. So um, <laughs> when we talk about productivity, um, I, I, I think that is so important, and, and it's not hard. And I think some of the things that you can and will talk about is, you know what? To be more productive, it doesn't mean you have to make a 180-degree change in your life personally and professionally. Just tweak this, polish that, and all of a sudden now that momentum takes over. So I'm excited to learn from you. Give us a little bit of your background and what your entrepreneurial journey has been like. Sure. Well, I've um, been an entrepreneur for, oh my gosh, since uh, I guess 99 or actually 96. So I've just um, had my own businesses. I started out as a what I thought I invented as a professional organizer, but discovered that there are thousands of them across the country. <laughs> and um, eventually I became a certified professional organizer for businesses where I would go in and do hands-on organizing and realized, I, I kept thinking, this is so easy. Why am I helping people and getting paid? But realizing that not everybody has that, that skill. And eventually became an author and speaker, you know, along the way uh, in those realm, in that realm. And, eventually also became a productivity coach. So I help, um, and we've niched down to where we help financial advisors and I work with them daily to help them to be as productive as they can be because without productivity, the day just sort of gets away from you and it's very frustrating and overwhelming. And so I help to get that under control. Um, yeah, I love that. And, and I love how you said niche down because so many times, whatever it is, whether the, whether it's a target market to find a niche or a vertical, it's so important because if you try to be all things to all people, you're no things to no one. Um, right. and I'll, I'll bet that concept of niching down could also be applied to productivity in the sense that, hey, look at this big to-do list. It's 427 bullet points. You're not going to get it done today. So let's niche down and focus on what we can do and let's start with this. Let's prioritize that. So how does that play into your coaching? Oh, wow. It's, that's like the biggest thing. I, I have a lot of clients who what I call, have what I call the swirls. You know, that to-do list is not even written down, much less in a True. plan. So yeah. um, it just keeps swirling around in their head and, and just trying to, the first thing is just to make sure we capture it somewhere, whether it's a CRM or a task list on paper or on, online. I don't care where it is, but just getting that, that, stuff out of your head and onto paper so that you can see it. 99 times out of 100, it's not nearly as bad as you think it is or how yeah. bad it feels. And so just getting it on paper and seeing it and being able to then decide which ones are the hot items that need to be done, the must-dos and then the, the should-dos and then the could-dos. And really, not a, there's all, that's just one step is getting it on paper. And one of my ideas that I have for my clients is just take it one more step and put everything on your to-do list into a time slot on your calendar. Don't just say you're going to do it because you'll, I, I call it to-do list an avoidance list <laughs> because you could down that yeah. list. You're like, ooh, I don't want to do that. I don't want to do that. Ooh, I don't want to do that. And you'll even do something that's not on the list. You'll write it on there so you could check it off. But, you know, just taking yep. the stuff that keeps getting pushed and pushed and pushed, make a decision of when you're going to do it, put it in your calendar, and honor that appointment. That is one yes. of the things about, being more productive is making decisions about what what you want to do with your time and when you want to do it. So when somebody interrupts you, you can say, I'm sorry, I can't do that right now. I planned on doing this right now. I can do it for you Friday or next Tuesday. You know, you can sort of just have a reason as to why you can't do something that someone just drops in your lap. Yeah. Um, I, yeah, I, I mean, we can unpack that so deeply and it makes me <laughs> Uh, think about an example of way back in the day, like, uh, and, and I'm sure that I'll butcher this example, but you'll understand the point and maybe you'll 
remember hearing this down the road uh, or from the past. Um, but apparently Andrew Carnegie from in the late 1800s um, was talking to someone and, and talking about, you know, helping me in my leadership or my organization or management of this company. And it, it says, uh, Hey, Carnegie said, uh, to this this consulting guy, you know, hey, if you can tell me something about management that's worth hearing, I'll send you a check for ten thousand dollars. And back then, ten thousand dollars was today like a gillion trillion, you know, gazillion. <laughs> and apparently, as the story goes, you know, he gives him this one task, and he does it. And about I don't know, however many day months later, sends him a check for way more than that, which was even more than what it would be today. And basically, it was. Every night, write down a list of things you must do the next day, and the next day you start with the first one, and you don't do anything else until you've done it, and then you move to the next one, and only, I think the number was like three. Do the top three things, and you will be yep. so much more productive. So <clears throat> when you were talking about lists, it reminded uh -huh. me of that, and I would venture to say that point oh 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 something percent of people, financial advisors you work with, work from that list. So do you find that that's one of the biggest issues that uh, your clients struggle with is actually having a list and then having a sequential way to attack that? Yeah, that's exactly what it is. It's, it's capturing the list first. And then, then a lot of folks are not good decision makers. There's a lot of, yeah. um, there's a lot of wiring that comes into productivity. People are not always wired, you know, in an organized fashion or a linear fashion. They think, you know, they have, they just, see things and they just run, jump to them. They see shiny pennies all over the place. So they, and they just jump to it. So having that list is such a critical point. And, and I often have them pick one to three things at a time because some people can't even do up to three. They just need to have one at a time and to stay focused. I have them set a timer sometimes because a timer gives you that release at the end so that you set it for 30 minutes and at the end of 30 minutes, you kind of assess where am I on this task? Am I done? And if you're not, then set it for another 15 or whatever timeline. But it's just having that focus. Focus is a big point that gets missed yep. um, for a lot of people as they're trying to get some tasks done. So, yeah, capturing that list and being able to choose what's important is critical. Okay, so I have a pop quiz for you. FOCUS. Good. What does that acronym mm -hmm. F-O-C-U-S stand for? Because if I'm remembering correctly, there's a really neat um, application to the letters in the word FOCUS. <laughs> I'm going to fail your quiz. <laughs> oh, no. I don't. <laughs> well, um, I believe it is focus on one course until successful. So okay. <laughs> F, focus, and O on one, one course until one. successful. So that's yeah. what focus is, is having that mm -hmm. list first, then picking that first one, the high, the one you rank them in, in priority, order priority, and then focusing on that first one, mm -hmm. not right. multitasking. And we can get into research of how that doesn't work. And we know all those things, but do that okay. one thing. And I would venture to say that if someone tried to have three, four things going on at once while we're doing that first thing, yeah, I made my list, but you're not going to be as effective, as polished as if you focused. Cause right now I don't have social media up. I don't have email up. I'm talking to you mm -hmm. and I'm focusing on this and I'm going, okay, Ooh, that's a good point. So how could someone take that one point and apply it to the business? So I love so far we're talking about knowing what you have to do, getting it down on paper, having that list, prioritizing that list because there's some things that you have to do before others and then starting with that first one with focus. So what's next? What's next is um, actually it, it's a bigger step than that. I, I kind of want to step back a little bit. It's, it's recognizing that many folks who have, if you're an entrepreneur, 99% of the time, I shouldn't even say that much, but a lot of the times you have, a, have complete control of your time. Nobody tells you what to do. Yeah. So when you wake up in the morning, you, you are in charge and you decide what you want. And so many times I offer a tool that I, that's called an ideal week and I help my clients create this ideal week. Because having that list of priorities is great, but you have to know when is your ideal time for, for doing that. And, and that can break down into so many different ways. Um, the ideal week, meaning you're saying, I only want to see clients on Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. So you never see clients on Mondays and Fridays. And so these tasks that you're taking off of your to-do list need to fit in in between client meetings or whatever it may be. Maybe you do your administrative work on Monday. You do some marketing on Friday. Just creating what you want your week to look like 
and then deciding as you're looking at your to-do list where these tasks fall into yeah. your choice of time blocks. And I was that is a the huge word part. time block. Yeah, I, mm-hmm. I remember way back in the day learning about time blocking, and mm-hmm. you should have times of the day that you check email, not as it could, not not like Pavlov's dog where you see a <laughs> notification or hear a ding, and you're like, ooh, you know, that's that's really de- yep. getting into squirrel, you know, from the old movie. Uh, oh um, my, you know, so yeah, time blocking. So maybe there's a block of time each day, each week that you're putting together where it's like, okay, I'm going to um, check my emails here and here. I'm going to check my voicemails there and there. And then I'm going to take client meetings here. I'm going to take, you know, my prep, whatever the case is. And then I feel like that would really be another help in mentally approaching your day where you go, okay, ooh, I've got to do that uh, client meeting. So they want it. But oh, I can't do it right this second. I'm going to do it on Tuesday and Thursday between 10 and 1. So I'm going to offer those times to them. And and I would say to you, um, I know I'm confident you have some tools you'd recommend. But when I hear this, I would say, you know, I use a scheduling tool. There's many of them out there, but I use one where I mm-hmm. would say, okay, for you know uh, these client meetings, let's say, I'm going mm-hmm. to offer them to clients on Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, 9 a.m. 11 a.m. and 1 p.m. Those are the times I offer. No other times during the week. So when a client needs or a prospective client needs that, I'm going to send that link. They're going to pick, and it drops into that time block. Do you? So a, do you find that um, using tools are effective that way? And then what are some other ones that that you would help uh, say would help financial advisors? Oh my gosh, uh, yes. Those those scheduling tools are the best thing since since sliced bread. I don't care. They are the best because they t- save so much back and forth and time. And also it keeps you from accommodating people. I have a lot of people who believe that they deliver insulin, <laughs> which they really don't. Um, they think it's so important when a client says, well, I can't come in during the workday. I need you to meet me on weekend or on, on a, in an evening. And they accommodate. But people will move whenever they get into those calendar tools and they, yeah. they'll just say, well, I guess I have to take a day off or I have to just do it on my lunch hour. Um, and it just keeps that back and forth of you dropping what you need to do and ruining your schedule and, and having to work Tuesday evening when you don't want to. So, yeah, there are that's a tool that is, if you don't use a scheduling tool yet, and I highly recommend it. It is the biggest time saver. And the other, the other tool that's not really a tool tool is delegating. A lot of people have the ability to delegate, but they don't. They're, they don't like to ask or they don't want to overwhelm somebody or they just figure I can do it best myself yes. or I don't have time to train them. Yes. There's a million excuses of why people don't delegate. But I got to tell you, when you hire somebody to do work, that's why you pay them and they want the work. That's why they're there. So they'll let you know if they're overwhelmed or it's too much or if they need to help you have you help them prioritize what's important. But if you have somebody please utilize that person. And if you don't have somebody and need somebody, hire somebody because as an entrepreneur, you are the person that is there to do what you're getting paid the most for and not to do work that is is somebody else's job. Oh, huge. Well, those two points, let's just take a pause real quick because I want to just really spotlight, highlight a couple of those aspects. Number one, the tool scheduling tool and your schedule and you're, you're not delivering insulin. I love that because I have a daughter Mm -hmm. that's type one and, and it's like, yep, got what you mean there. You need that bowl. Mm -hmm. You need that insulin. Well, guess what? I would say to you that there's another intrinsic aspect of that scheduling tool that comes into play that really is important to think about. If you are that high level CEO of a financial planning firm, and, and let's say that it's just even you. You need to strive to be that high level CEO. You know, so you, you need to be seen as someone that is not available to everyone at any second of the day, 24-7, yep. 365. It is a positioning um, tool play. Whereas if someone goes see me on Sunday afternoon, you're like, okay, cool. Or here's my number. It has to be 24-7. Okay, whatever. And you act. Then who's in control? not you. And so I think that that another aspect of that scheduling tool is, yes, um, efficiency, productivity for you, the the person who you're putting it on, but also your target audience and your clients, depending on, you know, if you're scheduling for initial meetings before they become a client or client meetings, 
you then are perceived consciously and subconsciously as that go-to person, that expert, that authority, because you won't just take my call at any point. I can't call you up and just get you on the phone because, oh, you might be in the middle of something for another client, but you know, I'm going to elbow my way in. What are your thoughts around that scheduling tool being more than just a convenient way to get something on the books? Oh, it, it's it's everything you just got done saying. There is a respect factor. When when somebody's in control of their time, people respect it. When you call your doctor's office, you don't call your doctor and say, I need to come in on Tuesday at four. They're gonna laugh at you. They're like, Well, we're not seeing patients till December, yep. so get on yep. get in line, buddy. And and you respect that and you know that that's the way and you can be that person. And I want to clearly say, when you say you're not available, that does not have to sound mean. You're not turning people away or hurting their feelings or damaging their relationship. What you're doing is you're setting expectations from the very beginning of what you'll do and what you won't do. And if people are on board, they'll stick with you. And if they're not, that's okay. They're not your people. And that's the line yeah, that you, you have it's boundaries. Like, um, it's how you explain it. And I would suspect it could be something like this. Hey, um, John, Betty, Sue, Harry, um, what, what I uh, strive to do in my practice is I am there focused 100% solely on you and your you know, retirement needs. And so that means that when I take meetings with you, I don't want to be distracted mentally or physically. I want to be there for you and I need to prepare for that too. So there are time blocks in my day that I am prepping for your uh, uh, you know, needs or details are mm-hmm. when when I offer specific times um, the reason that I'm only available certain times is I'm prepping for your meeting and to make sure that I'm researching so many things so that when I present you see where I'm going so I I, I really mm-hmm. think that mm-hmm. you're right and it, it all gets down to just how you say it and how and and it's mm-hmm. all about them um, it's all about your client they're the hero you're the guide and when you can articulate it that way they feel really um, uh, special and appreciated. But in reality, mm-hmm. you're going, no, I won't be kowtow to your every demand, but you're saying mm-hmm. it in a way that they're going, oh, I am important. Mm-hmm. And they're important and it's impressive. And here's the thing, like you said earlier, people don't want to work with a company or an advisor who's not growing. And yeah. if you're if you're sitting there waiting like the Maytag man, that's, yeah. that's just not a good sign. And so yeah. Um, I offer some language just for people to just say, you know, our practice is growing. We, you know, we're we're so excited to say that, and we're making sure that we can serve our clients as best we can. So we're we're no longer seeing clients in the evenings because we're staying focused on the day. Whatever it is, you can yes. just paint that picture. But the key is to communicate it, and not just yeah. like when people come to if they're used to meeting you in the evenings and all of a sudden they can't. You need to explain it and give them some reasoning and and just be upfront with them. And I think that's and, really and that transparency is helpful. What do you think about this? And this is, you know, everything is, every client is different. Every need is different. But what would happen if you start getting so many requests for evenings and you're sticking to that line? What if you said, you know what, I'm going to open up Tuesday evenings from um, five to eight mm-hmm. where I'm going to meet with clients. But guess what that means? I'm not coming in till noon. So now the messaging yeah. is, hey, guys, um, as, as my valued client, I am opening up my practice times to meet with people after um, evening hours, five to eight. So what that means is on Tuesdays when I open the evenings up, um, I'm not going to be available um, Tuesdays until noon because that then mm-hmm. is my family time. I'm shifting my personal family. Mm-hmm. So it really just gets down to structuring, time blocking, serving, providing value. I think that is massive and huge. Mm-hmm. Um, let me let me shift over to the other point you made on delegating. Um, I would I would I've heard this in the past too. So and I'm sure this is an exercise you would take some of your clients through. Hey, write down how much you made last year. Write down about approximately how many hours you worked. What's your hourly rate? Oh well, if your hourly rate is X, I'll bet you it is more than ten bucks an hour. Well, of course, you right. laugh, you know, and if that's the case, since that's the case, now the next step is I want you to write down in 30 minute time blocks for the next two weeks. What did you do during the work days? Oh, well, this mm-hmm. time block, I answered email. I did. And if you then can review the clerical admin type tasks that you really have no business doing because your hourly rate is way more than 10 bucks an hour, you can find mm-hmm. an assistant, a virtual assistant to do those clerical things that are not client facing and, and you, you know, things like that, but, but they can update this and send that and reformat this. And you mm-hmm. then stay focused on what is your highest and best use of your time. Is that a good way to think of, of delegating? It's, it's probably one of the best ways to think of it because you shouldn't be doing 
there's nothing the people who are assistants and virtual assistants they earn their money and and you are you're there for what you're there for and you need to earn and maybe it's 250 500 thousand dollars an hour and you need to just really have that support and not yeah. try to do it all yourself so yes and the other the other thing is is when you're talking about just tracking your time there are tools out there to do that for tracking your time which are really helpful and you know so if you don't want to sit there and write it down every every half hour you can do that. I have my clients do that a lot because they realize they're doing 17 hours a week of clerical or administrative work. Yeah. What's up with that? And so, so as you design this ideal week, as we talked about, I always, anybody listening, just think about what you want your week to look like. If you woke yeah. up on Monday morning and went to bed Sunday night, what would be the perfect week? The chances of you living that week exa- exactly as it's laid out are about zero because life happens. But if you don't have a vision initially, it's never going to happen. And I will, I will tag on one thing that you mentioned about that 17 hours of clerical. And it might be 27, it might be 7. I feel like it is not, well, you're going to replace all 17 hours with, maybe not. Maybe you're going to uh-huh. replace 10 of those 17 because maybe there's still 7 a week that only you can do. And yeah, yeah, I know it's clerical, but it kind of helps me prep for my meetings. But there will be a major percentage of those clerical things that if you were to free up. Now, what can you do with those Let's just pick 10 hours a week. What if you freed up 10 hours a week and it only cost you something nominal? And yes, those 10 hours might not be, you know, selling, bringing on new clients, but it should be leading toward that. And over time, then those 10 hours a week turns into um, increased revenues. So let's be practical too. You know, you you cannot say... Every second of every day will be so productive and earning this dollar amount per hour we calculated. So there's going to be those admin clerical things that, yeah, you're going to offload to delegate, but there's still going to be some that you have. We're mm-hmm. never going to get it to be where it's so delineated. So I think, you know, right. let yourself off the hook, <laughs> you know, realize work mm-hmm. towards toward that goal, but it's not going to be a, immediate or it's not going to be something you can change overnight. Right, and it's also—it's not always about money either. Either, as you said, sometimes it's just having a lifestyle practice where you actually have a life with your kids and your family, and you have uh, hobbies that you like to do, and you—you've neglected them because you're working 80 hours a week. You can get it down to a normal number. You can actually have a lifestyle that you want and not feel so overwhelmed. Mm-hmm. Well, I yeah, I mean, Patty, I think we can go on for about four and a half more hours. On, <laughs> ooh, here's another thing. So, what would you uh, say would be a final? point, maybe low-hanging fruit for something you offer your clients, work with your clients on that's kind of like a game changer when it comes to managing their day? Well, my favorite saying that I that I always use is if you don't take control of your time, someone else will. Ooh. And so it is imperative that you figure a way, whether it's using an ideal week or just starting to plan your day, taking your tasks and putting them into your calendar so that you assigned a time to do them. Take control of your time because you give it away and you can always make more money, but you can never make more time. So mm. stay in control of that time as much as you can. You have the power to do that if you're an entrepreneur, typically. Yes. Mm-hmm. 100%. Well, if someone is hearing this and thinks, you know what? Maybe my uh, financial services firm could use a little bit of polish. What's the best way they can reach out and connect with you? Um, the best way is just to visit our website. It's Productivity Uncorked. Dot com And if you want to chat, there's a place to schedule a call in the top right corner. You can contact us through the form there. Feel free to just um, take a look around. There's all kinds of things we do, coaching, speaking. Um, we do disc assessments because um, that's really important in the relationships of, that we have with our clients. So, yeah, the productivityoncork.com. Take a visit. Awesome. Well, Patty, thank you so much for coming out today. It was a real pleasure getting to know you. Same here, Mike. Thank you so much. I appreciate your time. You've been listening to Influential Entrepreneurs with Mike Saunders. To learn more about the resources mentioned on today's show or listen to past episodes, visit www.influentialentrepreneursradio.com.